Welcome to your authentic path to powerful leadership with Marsha Clark. Join us on this journey as we're uncovering what it takes to be a powerful woman leader. Well, Marsha, welcome back. Thank you very much, Wendy. To another video one. And Kathy, welcome. Thank so you. we have a guest Thank today. I'm and I'm going to let Marsha introduce our special guest today. Well, so uh, I've known Kathy now for 12 years. Yes. Can you believe that? I know. Yeah. And I met her as a participant in the Power of Self program. And uh, Kathy came in, uh, she was a, uh, I don't know, what would you call yourself, headmistress of the Hill School of Grapevine yeah. or something along? I think it was <laughs> yes. the principal at that yeah, point. Okay, principal or something, <laughs> but she was the top dog is what she was. And uh, came into the program as a part of uh, sponsorship from a woman who does a lot in the educational space. And Kathy's uh, work in Power Self was um, amazing. Uh, she has she is one of the best storytellers, which I'm sure you will experience here in this broadcast today, <laughs> this episode. If you're listening and if you're watching, uh, and we hope you are uh, watching as well as listening today, and and Kathy's work is um, amazing for children. Uh, the 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 benefit that Kathy brings to the child, you know, as simple as she talks about things as learning differences rather than disabilities. And I've always appreciated that, that we all learn in different ways and different uh, styles. And Kathy's supportive uh, in one, helping a child gain greater competence and confidence and the relief from the parents. I mean, I, that, that's what I think yes. about, whether it be parents, grandparents, or whoever primary caregivers are. And so um, I'm really excited about having you here today. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yay. Well, I'd like to jump in and get some clarity on the title of this podcast, The Phoenix. So I'm assuming we're talking about the mythical bird here and not a city in Arizona, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is the mythical yes. bird. And okay. I don't know how many of us remember all of that. But, you know, uh, you know, the, the, lo I love the title of this because it is about rebirth and recreation and that sort of thing. So I don't know. Kathy, if you want to talk anything about why that speaks to you in that regard, and I can fill in maybe some sure, of the, sure. the blank so, spots. Um, when I made the decision to open the Novus Academy, every school has to have it. And I decided that the, the best, most appropriate mascot would be the Phoenix. And um, there are so many legends about the Phoenix, you know, all of which tend to come back to um, life and and reemergence and growth and those sorts of things. And one of the things that I really loved about it is the Asian version of the Phoenix, because the, in, within Asian culture, the Phoenix is actually made up of different parts mm. of birds that come together. Yeah, I did not know this. It's the best parts of the birds. They come together to form the Phoenix. And there's one legend that says that the Phoenix, as long as the leader is brave and true and honest, the phoenix remains. Mm. If the leader ever becomes dishonest or leaves, the phoenix flies away ah. as well. And so that's why I, I, I love chose it. the phoenix. I, I love that. I love that too. Now, the the more traditional, and I'm, I'm going to read it here because I want to get it right, but it's the... Uh, it, it does exist in many cultures, and I'm more familiar with the American culture, obviously. And it, but it, it and it's lived a very, very long time. And so this phoenix a bird, uh, it it builds its own nest, beautiful nest filled with spices, and then in a spark, the whole nest and the bird are consumed by fire. And that is when the new baby phoenix emerges from the ashes um, of the previous bird and it represents renewal rebirth and resurrection and you know that that's a, a a part of why we wanted to do this but i'm also thinking about the genuineness of what you're describing in the asian version of that and to me that adds a whole nother very rich dimension to the to the myth yeah yeah i think it i think it so beautifully describes um culture and the the thing that we all can bring the things the best parts of ourselves that we can bring together um so yeah i love love the phoenix and um a little bit later we'll talk about how the phoenix helped me move through a yeah. process mm. well, and i also want to say if you ever saw kathy's school kathy had people come from all around the country and dare i say the world i don't know if you ever had anybody but there were lots of people that would come visit her school so the beautiful nest part 
if you saw her school, you would not know it was a school. Oh, wow. <laughs> it wow. Had, it was amazing. It had sparklings. It had it animals. Amazing. It had everything. So. Excellent. Excellent. It's true. So, Kathy, who was one of your first strong woman role models? So, the first was absolutely my mother. Okay. My mother was a strong woman. She was, in, in many ways, she was from New England, so she had that, the way that she carried herself and the, you know, her beliefs. Um, at the same time, my youngest brother, I, I have two siblings, mm -hmm. uh, two brothers younger than me. Um, my youngest brother ended up being identified with some significant learning differences um, during a period of time that in the late 50s, early 60s, parents were advised to place their children in institutions. Wow. And my parents would have none of that. And so I watched my mother as my middle brother and I, we, I say we were drug to therapy appointment after therapy appointment. And, and my father was in the Air Force. And so the moves that we made had to fall in line with services that my brother, mm -hmm. youngest brother would need. And so I saw my mother as an advocate at a, during a period of time in our history that there was no such thing as an advocate for that type of child. Right. And so she was definitely the first. And that's something that Kathy and I share because I too, as you know, had a sister who was um, mentally retarded. Um, more than learning differences, she never, you know, she had to be, take a bottle until she died at the age of 18, wore diapers, the whole thing. And my mother also went through the, put them in a home, and my mother would have no part of that. And all of the, dare I say, uh, harshness, the mean-spiritedness of what people would say uh, with a child who looked different, sounded different, had differences, was pretty... I, I, for me, I was appalled by it even as a child, and you know, thus you and I yeah. are advocates for <laughs> for those who might Absolutely. be a little different. Yes. Well, and the words were so horrible. Yeah, they Imbecile, were. Yeah, retarded. They were. Oh yeah. Um, you know that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I still, I have to say, when somebody calls somebody retarded just because they don't do something that that person thinks they should do. It boils my blood. Oh, oh I yes. bet. Those that know me know you don't ever say the R word in my presence. Yes. And yes. if that mistake is made, it's only made one time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's never right. Happens again. That's right. And it never happens that's right. again. That's right. That's right. So mom was a big role model for, model for you. Who else? So the truth is, the um, when I was um, the second person, the second female, that as I look back would have been modeling strength in a woman. I didn't realize it at the time. But it was, I was in my early 20s. My husband and I got married. We were in our early 20s. I had not been successful in college. Had no idea why, because school was easy. I never studied. I never you know, needed to. And I was fine with a C or a B. A college was a whole other story. You actually had to show up for class. Yeah. <laughs> and do the work. And so I had struggled and uh, decided to go back. And so I went to Brookhaven Community College okay. in Dallas. And there was a woman, I, I don't know her name. She was teaching um, English, this is the basic freshman English that you take mm -hmm. in college. She worked um, for Highland Park ISD. She was a high school English teacher. And it was the first or second class that we had, and she just made this statement. And, and what she said was, there are few among us that have the, the pleasure of having our profession aligned with our passion and our purpose. Mm. When she said it, I didn't quite understand what that meant. Um, didn't take long though for me to realize how important that mm. statement was. And I've lived my life according to those principles because I, I have had the great fortune of having my passion purpose beautifully aligned with my profession. Wow. The P words. The P words. <laughs> exactly. Personal, professional, exactly. passion, purpose. You yeah. know, and it just, you know what else it did is it, it, it reminds me of the fact that especially as educators, but people, just people, we have to, to be mindful that a single thing we say in a certain way on a given day could stick oh, for yes. a lifetime. And, um, and that's a, just a beautiful, beautiful moment. They can stick in a good way or a bad way, yes, but unfortunately. It was many, many years before the next strong woman came along. Uh -huh. so many years. So I want to hear the story, though, about how you weren't quite sure, but it struck you. How did you make that connection personally and sort of at a deeper level to know. Okay. So what had happened is I mentioned my brother earlier. Well, um, I was, when I was 14, we were stair steps, 14, 13, 12. My youngest brother that I'd, I'd spoken of, I got leukemia mm -hmm. 
And he lived with leukemia for a short period of time. And um, then one night, we got my brother and I, my middle brother and I, we got home from school and the house was locked. And that had never happened. And so we both assumed, well, they'd taken Chris to the, the hospital. But then it started getting dark. And I was terrified of the dark. I'm still, I still don't love the dark, but I was terrified. And so we had bushes in front of our house. And so I hid inside the bushes and I was in there and I was terrified. And of course my, my other brother was making fun of me and doing the things that (laughs) That siblings do. do. Um, But there was this moment. And I just remember looking through the, the leaves in these bushes and I saw the stars. And in that moment I knew my brother was dead and it was good. (gasps) It was this peaceful feeling that just washed over me because he'd been suffering so much. And um, I don't know how much time passed after that, but then I remember the headlights coming down. We lived in a cul-de-sac and I remember Mm -hmm. the headlights coming and my parents, uh, the garage going up and all. Only other thing I remember from that period of time was my mother came into my room that night, sat on the edge of my bed and said, God sent him to us for a reason and took him for a reason. And our job is to figure out why, what was his purpose. So that's where the purpose connected. That's where it connected uh, for the first time where it connected. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We're, we're totally off script. I just want to let everybody know that. That's why I'm just floundering around over here. That's quite all right. So um, I have a note here about uh, Kathy, you being in the hospital giving birth to your son. Yes. yes. Okay. D- using your voice to stand up to another woman first other than your I'd mother. Ever done it. Yeah. Let's hear the about first that. Time I had ever done it. So um, I gave birth to this huge baby. <laughs> he was, okay. He was 10 pounds, but he was short and just, oh my goodness. Oh. Well, I died for several yeah. minutes, literally. And oh, so, goodness. Um, I just remember that they had my. When I finally have any memory, I had my head was below my feet and no one was helping me eat. There was nobody in the room. And so this nurse, remember Nurse Ratchet? In the, oh, yes. <laughs> nurse Ratchet came in and they had this green jello and I was trying to eat it with my fingers and she wouldn't help me. Well, then a little while later, they brought uh, medication for me to take a pill. I couldn't swallow pills. I couldn't. I took them with applesauce. So I said, I can't. I need some applesauce. And she tore into me about mm-hmm. what kind of a mother was I? What do you mean you can't take a pill? Blah, blah, blah. And so, don't know why, but in that moment, I said, you'll need to bring me some applesauce. And then she came with the applesauce. And so I very slowly, I was so passive aggressive, <laughs> I ate that applesauce. I didn't even attempt to take the pill until there were like two bites of applesauce left. And she couldn't leave until I took the pill because she had to know I took the pill. And so that's the first time that I realized, okay, wait a minute. I don't have to just accept. Right. What's, just because someone says it's supposed to be a certain way doesn't mean it has to be a certain way. Yeah. Whether it be a certain way in general or for you. Exactly. Like some people can take pills and some people can take right. it with water. That was not your story. Oh. And I think about how that aligns with the work that you've done with the children that come to you. Not everybody's going to do it a certain no. way. And then the beratement or the you know embarrassment or the shame that we try to put on someone because they're different. Yes. I mean, that, those true. things stick deep they and stick. hard. They stick yeah. and they... They, it leads to who we become yes. mm-hmm. as people. And um, I, I choose to believe that most of the time people don't mean to be hurtful or harmful with words and actions, although I know there are plenty that are. Um, at the same time, the more we can, which is one of the reasons I love education, is the more we can help mm-hmm. our, our boys and our girls find their voices and yes. use them, yes. um, the better off we all are. Yeah, advocating on behalf of themselves as well as others. Uh, But I have to find my own voice before, oftentimes before I can help someone else find theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a quote here. It's a Shakoba quote that feels kind of perfect for where we are right now. And the quote is, the wild woman rises like a phoenix from the ashes of her life to become the heroine of her own legend. And now hearing a couple of your stories so far, Kathy, I think it's, this quote's a perfect way to even open up even more of your stories to talk about the people whose lives you've touched with the work that you do. 
I love that quote. I do too. I absolutely love that quote because it it is what happens. And it, this all of this started um, back when I was in college and I was going through because I knew I wanted to be a special education teacher. Okay. And I wanted to do that at the secondary level. But as I was being taught and trained, it wasn't making sense. The traditional special education methodology that we still use to this day mm-hmm. in schools didn't make sense. And so from the get-go, from my, the very first job I ever had as a first-year teacher, I was pushing back against the status quo because, you know, a, a tangible example is that one of the first go-tos for every child who struggles is short assignments. Right. Um, well, no human being gets better at anything by doing less of something. Right. Yeah. We have to do more. Mm-hmm. And so that was the first thing that just didn't make sense. And so my whole career has been built on people telling me over and over and over again why what I think could work won't mm-hmm. work. And I, there came a point in time, a few years in to my career, where I, I realized my whole life has been lived based on this, these two foundational pieces. And that's, yeah, I hear you telling me no, but what if I could? And the next piece of that then becomes, am I willing to do the work that it takes? Right. And so Beautiful that's questions. what I've been doing for 34 years is showing as many people as possible what you were taught doesn't work. And it's just, it's not difficult. Mm-hmm. And it certainly doesn't take any money to shift to what does work. Right, right. For those so, that struggle. So share with us your because what I'm hearing is a new model of education. Yes. Tell us how you shifted that and how that applies to your school. So the first thing that I realized was that human beings are relational. And whether you love school or you hate school, as a, as a person, we want to be seen. Mm-hmm. We need to be noticed. And so the first thing that has that happened in any school I've ever run had been just very simple I have always been outside greeting the students as they come. And I'm terrible with names, horrible with names. But one of the first things we always taught in schools that I ran was we called them procedures. And yes. the first one was how to introduce yourself to another person. And pre-pandemic is with a firm handshake and, and those things. And eye so contact. Eye contact. Mm-hmm. Um, and even when your culture doesn't support eye contact, find a spot. Find a place yeah. somewhere that you're, you're comfortable with. Um, and so all I would say to them, and to this day I do it, is greet me like you don't know me. And so they would have to say, good morning, Mrs. Edwards, my name is. <laughs> and so I do that until I, I got to know them. And I um, was using Novus to, to show other educators what could be done. And so I would tell administrators and teachers, it doesn't matter the size of your school, divide and conquer. Relationship is the first. When children feel seen, they know that they're, they're loved, mm-hmm. they'll do anything. What's Novus? So Novus is a school that I started. Okay. Um, I'm no longer with Novus. Okay. Um, but it was something that came about because um, there came a point in time, the organization that I was with, the Hill School, mm-hmm. we'd reached a point where um, we were a first through um, eighth grade satellite campus mm-hmm. of the Hill School of Fort Worth. And we had 12 families that needed a high school. And there wasn't a high school in the area that they felt would work. And it was too far logistically for them to take their children to the Fort Worth campus. And so what ended up happening was, um, and this is where having ADHD is a good thing, the (laughs) impulsivity piece of it, because if I thought about it, I never would have done it. Um, But what happened was the the board gave me permission to do a feasibility study. So I raised the money, I did it, presented to the board. And at that time, the board said, you make a compelling case, we see that you need it. And then they took a vote and there was only one yes vote. The rest were no's. And so I, re- I said, please help me understand this. Because I have to go back. To- oh, before they took the vote, I said, the bell you ring, you can't unring. Be it a yes or be it a no. So I said, I asked why. They said, well, if we allow you to have a ninth grade program of instruction, you'll come back to us in a year and you'll want a 10th and then an 11th and then a 12th. They said, of course I will. <laughs> of course I will. Right. So anyways, um, because it was a no, that was a Tuesday night before Thanksgiving break, I, I did what I teach. And what I teach is when terrible things happen, you allow the emotion to wash over you. Let it just mm-hmm. consume you for a brief period of time. Mm-hmm. And then you switch to, okay, what is the lesson? What do I do? So I cried all the way from Fort Worth to my, ho- my house in Arlington. And then my husband said, it's time to start your own school. 
So literally, that was a Tuesday night. Wednesday morning, I went in, pulled the assistant principal in, and I said, I'm going to start my own school. No clue how. But there were 12 families counting on me to do it. And it was a sense of duty and obligation. Wow. Well, and it goes back to your purpose and passion. And it goes back to your commitment to what if it could be done and what do I need to do and, to and am I willing happen? to do it? And and when I think about all of that, that to, to go to her school and to meet those students and to see how they treat each other, how they treat the teachers, how they treat guests, mm-hmm. parents of other children coming in, she has all of them believing that they can. I mean, that's the absolutely. Of what we're Absolutely. When they've heard most of their lives what they can't do, yes. you shared with them and let them know in no uncertain terms and loved and supported and affirmed them of what they could do. And the other thing I want to tie around Kathy's work to what we've included in the book mm-hmm. and these podcasts is every single human needs to be seen heard yes. and valued. And so you you had the, they need to be seen, they need to be yes. heard. And the valued part is what she gives to them that so many school systems don't. And anyone with learning differences gets sent to a special school that has a whole stigma mm-hmm. attached to it. Mm-hmm. And it's not a good one. Right. And so that's what I love about the beauty of what you've done. Um, and it's not just in Kathy, it's in every person she hires. It has to, ha- they have to have that same mm-hmm. purpose, passion, and magnetism that that makes yeah. it, it real right uh, yeah and the other piece of it is it has to be built upon genuine success mm-hmm. not artificial success mm-hmm. you know people know you know if i tell you you've done a great job marcia you know you haven't right and so it's all based one of the the, the pillars is it's genuine success mm. you can do more than you believe you can and you're not getting out of here until you do more right it's right just a, you know so since this model was new and different for everyone, how, how did you get people to go along on the journey with you of this new school? Like, how did you sell it? What was, how did you get started? That's an excellent question. So, <laughs> um, as far as people within the profession, convincing them and convincing the, some of the teachers that I was working with at the time that, yes, we can do this over the top. Thing, um, it wasn't as difficult as I expected it would be, but I've learned that um, I've always had to lead by example. Always, mm-hmm. always mm-hmm. Have, have had to be a true instructional leader. And so um, it wasn't as difficult with, with the people present in the school as it was with educators outside the school. Mm. And um, educators are tough. We're mm-hmm. a tough, tough audience. And I knew that... I, the whole goal was to create a model of what could be in our country because I, I created a nonprofit. What if we could? And what if we could was, was the, the mission is or was, I don't even know how to put it now yeah, since yeah. they took it, um, is um, what if we could use the, the principles that are here at Novus? What if every school in our country was doing this? Yeah. It's a game changer. It's okay. an absolute game changer. And... Um, so very quickly, what I quickly discovered was bringing educators in to see it for mm-hmm. themselves was all it took. Okay. It's all it took for them to see what could be, what right. was possible. And then it just grew from there. The educators would come see it and then they would go back to their schools or districts and tell someone, okay, you need to go see this. You need to see what's happening. So what were the core principles? So the core principles were, were based on relationship um there's no such thing as you can't okay the, the words try and can't are off limits because when you say i love that i, I hate the word try try i'll you try can't try if somebody says well i really tried to get my work done i'm i'm channeling yoda what? for yeah. my husband exactly. right now there is no, there there is is no, no try. try you will do or you or won't that's did right you or did you not yep. and so that piece of it the next is that it's important that every day of our lives, we actively seek opportunities to leave whatever part of the world we touch better than better. we found it. Yep. And then it becomes work ethic, perseverance, and tenacity. And then beyond that, it just flows. Mm-hmm. It just flows. It's, um, it's difficult to, to really explain the culture. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something that you almost had to, to feel to really... Right. 
right. embrace it and right. really get it. Um, Another thing that I'm hearing underlying all of this, and you haven't said this word yet, but I'm going to throw it in there, is that there's an underlying expectation of taking on responsibility. Yes. Like when children yes. are expected to take on a responsibility, that therefore gives them A, a sense of pride, but B, a sense of, okay, other people are expecting things from me, whether that's behavior, results, you know, actions, words, emotion, ch- you know, channeling emotion in a positive way, all of that, just that word responsibility. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned it because what it, they're, they're novicisms, they call the things that I say. And one is, and no one's responsible for you, but you. Right. No one can make you do anything but you. Right. And one of the things that I learned from you, Marsha, was the, the idea of choice. Right. Yes. There's no such thing as no choice. Right. We all have a choice. And so right. that's exactly how I started working with students and families was based on the concept of you always have a choice. And, yeah. and what I would say to the, to the students was you need to make a choice. Choose well. Yeah. Because you're going to live with the consequences, the consequences. of your actions. Exactly. Well, and I, I want to say one other thing. So Kathy did everything in the beginning from testing students okay. who may or may never have been tested or tested as thoroughly as she did. So her ability to test and diagnosis was top class, okay. gold standard, all of those kinds of things. She had kids in her school with dyslexia, ADD, ADHD, Tourette syndrome. I mean, you ran the full spectrum autism, of all of that. Autism, uh, gifted and talented. I was going to say, okay, we've, we're talking the about the low, the, 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 I'm going to just, the low end or this, sure. this right end of one scale. Yeah. So there were gifted and talented yes. at the other end. So you were literally dealing with yes. society. We'll yes, continue. because my goal was for, for educators and school administrators to buy into this model I needed to replicate traditional class public school classrooms as best I could. Mm-hmm. So I needed that. And the, the other piece of it is different children need different things. And so um, individuals with autism, high functioning autism, they need great social models and great right. language models. And so it's this, this balance to be able to show educators when they came, look at this classroom, this mirrors the society you work with yeah this, exactly this and look what can be done right what's possible so your academy is up and running what made your this new model so appealing and successful for the parents the teachers like what what was it that was really the appeal so, factor um i just uh, you know I, i'm gonna own it People there forever, you go. Thank forever, you. People have called me the child whisperer and I am, I really am. Wow. And I have the unique ability to sit at every seat around the table because I am the sibling of mm. someone. I have two children with learning differences. I have learning differences. I've been a school teacher, a school administrator, a educational diagnostician. I have a private assessment practice. Um, and I spent Six and a half years exactly working with um, adolescents with severe emotional behavioral disorders. And so what I'm able to say to to students is there is nothing, and to parents, (laughs) there's nothing you can possibly say or do that's going to shake me. Wow. Nor is there anything you can possibly say or do that's going to get me to turn away from you. Mm. I understand what's going on here. And so, and the parents, I don't, I don't understand it. But parents love spending time with me. And, and I, think it's, I think it's because I sit at every seat. Mm-hmm. I, I have the ability to empathize, not sympathize. Um, but the most important piece of all of this is now, you know, okay. Now what do we do? Now what do we do right. about it? That's the most important thing is, you know, normalize it. But, you know, and, and helping families understand your child isn't broken. Yeah. Your child's not yeah. broken. I, I want to say something about that because one of the things that Kathy taught me early on was if your child is is struggling, there there are options or ways in which you're going to know it. They're going to act out. Mm-hmm. They're going to withdraw, or was class it clown. A, a class clown kind mm-hmm. of thing? Or they're going to get help, right? I mean, yeah. and that was the most parents had gone through a lot of the acting out, you know, and and it could be anything from eating disorders to cutting 
to class clown to, you, you know, depression to mm-hmm. you name it. Well, they had seen all of that. The one thing they hadn't seen was or get help. And to me, part of the attraction for parents, grandparents, and so on was, oh my gosh, here's an option that no no one else has offered no up does. to us right. in, in a way that sounds like it could really work. And you and it, the longer you've done this, the more examples you yes. have. Her, her kids go on to college. It's not like yeah, they're yeah. just getting them through the high school graduation prog- program to, you know, hopefully succeed in living alone in life. I mean, right. this is being successful yeah. by all the traditional Yes, and what I've always told families is if um, when your child's smile returns, you'll know it's working. Mm, Because the first thing a child loses is their smile. They know it before you know it. Yeah, And kids are kids. And so your children that struggle in preschool and kindergarten and first grade, they're being called those things on the playground. They know it and they lose their smile. Mm -hmm. But um, at Novus when I was there, it never, never took more than two days. And that's, that was the first thing that parents would say is, I don't know who this child is because he or she couldn't wait to get here. Aww. And that's the hallmark, I believe, of what a school Wow. And those are non-traditional metrics. It's not exactly. scores. It's not, no. you know, stars, test, tack, test, whatever, all yeah. those things oh, are. Oh, we have tests. those too, but it's but not. But you do, but that's yeah. not, the, that's not, that's what's not important. the sole metric no. that, you know, keeps you motivated to keep no. doing the good work. No. Yeah, yeah. So how long were you at the school? So I started the school in 2013. Okay. And I was there until November 1st, 2021. All right. And reasons for leaving? You want to talk well, about that? Well, it wasn't my choice. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm the first thing that comes to mind is victim of the pandemic. I'm not a victim of anything. Okay. Um, the pandemic certainly contributed yeah. to what happened. And so... Um, what ended up happening is that um, we were on we were on the last cruise that came into Galveston, Texas, at the beginning of the the uh, wow. pandemic. And so at first I thought, hey, we get another week off at spring break. Well, it didn't take a couple, but a couple of days to realize. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, this, this is, is not, not just a second spring break. No, and I had the uh, a parent in the school who is an epidemiologist and a. Uh, public health professor Mm. and she was helping guide me along the way. And so what ended up happening, my husband was the IT director in the school. And so um, on that Monday after spring break in 2021, March, we, he and I were at the school nonstop seven days a week from six or seven in the morning till after midnight straight, no breaks, no vacation, no nothing. And so, but that's what it took. Mm Mm-hmm. It, it took that because we weren't just carrying um, the students. We were supporting families. Um, there was a lot of support that had to go to the, the employees mm-hmm. and the staff. It was a tough, tough time. Um, and there came a point where I just, I pushed back. I um, wasn't getting the support that I needed from a group of, of actually the board. And I just rose up and said, I can't deal with this dysfunction anymore. I don't, I, and I, my words are, I'm not confident that you can lead this organization where it needs to go post pandemic. Okay. Um, and then I was terminated that night. I said that, and then I was terminated that night. Um, as was my husband, his, his, you know, my crime was I spoke up. His was that he was married to me. <laughs> Um, so that was horrible. Mm -hmm. It's almost, uh, it's difficult to even describe it because it was, uh, Novus was the manifestation of 34 years of my career and frankly, my life Yeah, because it all goes back to the night my brother died and my mother saying what was the purpose. And so, um, in the first, I don't know, I you spoke to me not long after it happened. Three, three days after. Was three days after, yeah. And, and in those first moments, I just, I was lost. I, um, Novus had consumed me since 2013. And mm-hmm. it was like, I had nothing. It was your identity. Completely. Yeah. And um, it was that coupled with, oh, what about the kids? What about, um, because um, in the mix of all of this, um, we hadn't started succession planning yet. Oh. There was no one in the building that could pick up and take over. 
although these three individuals thought that it could happen and you know quickly discovered it wasn't working. Three individuals being the board members. The board members. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, what kind of happened is that the first person, of course, people, actually, I did something. I posted on Facebook for two hours. I just <laughs> put a message saying that I had been uh, terminated from Novus because I needed people to know it mm-hmm. and, to avoid the gossip. And then, of course, I pulled it. I pulled it off and the right people saw it. Um, and it was just horrible. Yeah. Just horrible. Well, then, Marsha, you were the first person that I spoke with that um, was helping me understand um, I wasn't broken. Uh, Because the other piece of it was, like, this would have made sense if I'd done anything. Right. That should result in termination. I still, it would have been hard, but it hadn't done anything. Right. And And you ask, and the board didn't tell you why? I asked, and and the answer was... um, you know, when, when the board member came into my office that night and said, we've made the decision to terminate your employment effective immediately um, with a police officer to escort me out immediately. Yeah, I'm not dangerous. <laughs> so I turned to this person and I said, okay, why? And the reason I was given was there is no reason. There doesn't have to be a reason. This, Texas is a, a right to work. and Right to work. There doesn't have to be a reason. I said, so let me see if I have this right. You have fired me, but I haven't done anything to be fired. That's correct. There is no reason. It was like, what do you do with that? Well, and I also want you to get that these, because most of your board members were either parents or past parents or grandparents right. of children, mm-hmm. that they had entrusted their children to her. Yes. Right. And now all of a yes. sudden she's not fit to be the head of the school. Yeah. And I even said um, in the board meeting before they did it, I said to two of them, I said, you know, um, because I, was one of them said, if I choose to fire you, I can fire you. And I said, you can. And what happens to the school? And this person said, oh, it'll go under. And I said, so the message I'm receiving is you can choose to fire me. And yes, you can. Absolutely. Um, you believe school will go under if you do. I said, but here's the larger message. What I'm receiving is you and your family got absolutely everything you could out of me and you needed for your family and the hell with everybody else everybody else, and all of the families that are walking the shoes you used to walk in. That's the message I'm receiving. And about 30 minutes later, I was fired. So anyways, Marsha, you were the first one. And then I have, I have great friends, a great system of support. And it took... It took me uh, several weeks to hear it, to then begin to believe it. And, and what the it was is that they took what wasn't theirs to take, but all they got was the physical manifestation of my work. They didn't get novice. They don't right. own me. Right. And um, that's when I started to heal. That's when I started to realize, okay, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, you, you got the stuff. Yeah. But stuff isn't... That's not novice. Right, right. Well, and I want to reiterate, too, your point about you teach the children to let the emotions wash yes. over you yes. and then say, what do you yes. do with it? And that's what you had to go through. I had mm-hmm. to do it. I had to do it. And, and you know, I have learned through life, um, we have to fail. Yes. We have to yeah. have those it's moments inevitable. that we yeah. crash and burn. And it, it goes to how resilient are we? right. And so, you know, my takeaway is that I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be when I grow up. <laughs> I know that I am an important voice in the field mm-hmm. of education, particularly uh, for students and families that have children in the struggle. Um, I know that I, I so badly miss school community. Mm-hmm. I, I need you know, community. Um, at the same time, I... Um, I've, I'm just this person, you know, this is in the rear view mirror now. Right. And so I'm ready for something much better based upon what I've learned, which goes to what I do now. So now's where the Phoenix title kicks in to the story. So after all of this that happened, you decided to reimagine your dream. Yes. So what's next? So I started a company, uh, and it is reimaginingeducation.us. Okay. Because there are other reimagining education type programs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in the beginning of this, I guess I started it was November, December 
January, late December, early January is when I started. Okay. Started doing this. Um, and at the time I had a non-compete, a one year non-compete in my contract. And so I could only provide services that Novus Didn't. doesn't pr- provide. Okay. So um, right now I provide evaluations, mm-hmm. academic evaluations, um, advocacy work, some consulting work. I'm in the process of becoming a certified ADHD coach. I've been doing the work forever. Right. Um, but going through that process at the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm at the crossroads right now where I don't know if I want to align myself in some way with an existing school program or I want to do the work that it takes to open another okay. school. Um, I'm not sure where, I, where I'm headed with that. I, I love the freedom I have right now. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize um, how exhausted I was from several years of doing, you know, what we were doing. Um, but I'm pulled back. I'm just, I'm drawn to that passion mm-hmm. and that purpose. Passion, that purpose. That. passion and yep. purpose. And so um, that's the big question is. Okay. And I want to le- leave our listeners and our viewers with a couple of messages here. When Kathy and I talked on day three, whatever it was, night of day three, um, the big message around power <laughs> Mm-hmm. is don't give your power away by letting someone else define you. And when you're in the throes of something like this, it's like your guts have been ripped out, your heart's mm-hmm. been ripped out, and you are a shell, right? Mm-hmm. You, you're, it's emptiness, it's loss, it's grieving, it's mm-hmm. hurt, it's disappointment, it's anger. All of that is a wash, which is why you just have to let have that to let it. come all over you. And yet, if we allow that to stay with us or stick, as victims, right, or as um, poor pitiful me, this idea of I hold on to my power by not allowing others to define me. And that's where you've gotten to, is that there's nothing wrong with you. It's no. Right? And that, um, so that's a huge lesson. Mm -hmm. The second lesson I want to leave our listeners with is sometimes there has to be a breakdown before there can be a breakthrough. Mm. And even when I think about me leaving my corporate life, and it it was my choice, and I resigned and all that, but the circumstances were so bad that I didn't feel like there was a better choice for me to make. And I agonized over it for months and on and on and on. What I know and what I have told you and I I want our listeners to hear is um, big things often happen because something bigger is waiting to emerge. So. Big bad things. Yes. Yeah. Big bad Big things bad happen. Things. And so this to, idea of the breakdown before the breakthrough, mm-hmm. I want to give our readers this analogy. If you break your arm and you test the strength of your arm, if it's set correctly, heals properly, when those bone, when the, the two ends of the bone that broke knit back together, that is stronger mm-hmm. than it was before you broke your arm. Yep. Now, I think that other part of that lesson is if it is set correctly and heals properly. Right. And that's the healthy part yes. of it, right? So set correctly says I have a great support system. Set correctly says I'm not going to make a, a, a boneheaded decision in a time Quickly. when I'm not emotionally right. you know, really prepared to do that. Um, healing is doing the work which only we can do. So it's working through the grief, the disappointment, the anger, the frustration, the hurt, all of that. And then I'm stronger on the other Mm -hmm. side of it. And so I want to say that, and I purposely said the second one, second, because I think it is a nice segue into the whole Phoenix rebirth, Mm -hmm. breakthrough thinking that you're you're, you're, you're now thinking about what, and it's also the, the analyzing, okay, what, what was working? Like for me, it's what was working with Novus well? What were the things that just weren't sitting, Mm -hmm. you know, well with me um and what would i do differently what will i do and that's turned into what am i going to do differently wow well this journey is still unfolding i love it it is and we often talk about being and doing and kathy her being is solid right Mm -hmm. you know who you are but but it's taken a minute for you to get there right it did it was from november to January before you were ready to take a next step. And, and so the being is still there, solid, clear, purposeful profession, all of that. 
Uh, it's the what, mm -hmm. the doing part, yeah. mm -hmm. so yeah. the being in the doing part. It's the doing that is still emerging and unfolding. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because You're rebuilding that I'm, nest. I'm rebuilding, exactly. It's it's what is that nest going to look like now because the, the fundament, fundamental mission is still there. Right. Changing education for as many educators, children, and yeah. families as I can across the country. Yeah. And so it's there. I just, and, and the nest is, it's got a foundation. But you know, my nest is going to be full of color and sparkle and just <laughs> glitter and ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I yeah. love it. Right now, you know, so some of those animals, I've got a tortoise living in my house, a oh. cockatiels added to the dogs I have. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Well, for yeah. those who are just listening and not watching, I have to describe Kathy has on a long gold necklace that has two what looks like Chinese symbols. Tell us what's going on okay, there, so Kathy, what this before is. we leave. So one of these is my name. This one is my name. It is Chinese. Okay. This one is my mother's. And so in times that I um, may, might need a little more strength, I might right. need to, to sort of be reminded, I wear this. It, they're beautiful. There, there are two gold pendants. Yeah, Again, beautiful. for those who are listening, it, there are two gold pendants hanging from this chain, and, and they're beautiful. I just had to ask. I love everything about that. That that when I need a little more strength. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my I symbol. Carry her with me. This Here's is what total. this is what Here's reminds me. Yeah, yeah, it's a total. It's I love that. Well, Marsha, thank you so much for having Kathy on today. Absolute pleasure. Thank yes. you. This was fun. Yes. Thank so you. All of us can now consider our opportunities to rise like a phoenix. I know that as we were talking, I'm sure, I mean, I was having spinning up memories in my mind of lessons to learn and things to apply as you were talking. So thank you. And and I do agree with that. None of us gets through this life without something. Right. Right. No, right. Everybody's got a story and everybody's yes. working on something is what I say often and uh, frequently. Well, that's the same thing. But anyway, you know what I mean? Uh, and so, you know, this idea of how do I choose to respond to those things that are exactly. going to happen to me? Mm -hmm. And it goes exactly. back to the choice points of I do have a choice. I can play pitiful me. And, and I say, don't shortchange yourself on how you're feeling. Just don't choose to live there. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's giving our power away yes. and letting yes. someone else define us. And, yes. You know, if it's if it's about authentic leadership, no one can have your exact journey or my exact journey or yours. Oh, right. You have your own. And hopefully you've gleaned some nuggets or tidbits out of today's stories and examples and experiences that we share that, that give you some additional insight that might serve you well, uh, whether you've gone through it or in the middle of it or inevitably it will happen. So uh, maybe you'll, you'll hearken back to the, some of the things you heard here today. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I was, I've always told people, um, every one of us is an accident, an illness or birth away from being directly impacted by a disability, a disorder or a difference. That's exactly right. So, you know, we may be at a point in life where, well, I don't, that's not really of interest to me. I don't want to be part of that. You are just an illness, an accident or a birth away. Being directly impacted. Well, and I want to leave one other story, and this is this is the heartwarming part of what my experience with Kathy is. So, my stepson's oldest daughter was diagnosed with um, dyslexia. She wasn't diagnosed in her school system, but she um, she had a brand new kindergarten teacher. She went to a public school. Uh, her her new kindergarten first year kindergarten teacher said she was out of a class um, ranking of A, B, or C. She was a C. But her her idea of uh, consoling the parents about uh, my granddaughter being a C level was, oh, it's okay. It's just kindergarten. We don't fail anybody. Well, of course, the parents were like, but why was she a C? What are we going to do to help her not be a C as she moves through school? And so Kathy had just recently been a, in the program, so I knew her, I knew her work, so we send my granddaughter over to talk to, to Kathy. She gets diagnosed with dyslexia. She goes into a class with six students and, you know, so on and so forth. So she started school in the August, September time yep. frame, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So part of her first, what I would describe as a more traditional metric was, here's a list of 10 words, three-letter words. You have to be able to read them in 30 seconds, mm -hmm. I think it was. And so her mom and dad would drill her on these things. And 
You know, the way I always think about dyslexia is when we see the word and, A and D, she saw it D-A-N, right? The yeah. words and letters, and she's also dysgraphic, so she wrote letters backwards and all that kind of stuff. So every every day she got, you know, drilled to learn these words and so on and so forth. And I remember her saying the day she finally hit, got all 10 words in the 30 seconds. And she said to her mother, I cried about this for weeks, mm-hmm. you know I did. Um I'm so glad to know my brain's not. Oh, gosh. And this is a six-year-old. Yep. And I just think about the variations and the versions Mm -hmm. of that, Kathy, of I'm so glad to know my brain's not. And that people can love me, you know, regardless of all those differences I might have. And so, you know, I just am invite our readers if you're concerned or worried about some of those things get things checked out Mm -hmm. and we'll put kathy's contact information if that's something that you want to know or learn more about and i i could could not recommend her more highly because of the personal experience of my stepson's daughter my granddaughter um and what she did for her and you know i was talking to her it's been a little while ago and i said do you remember your teacher oh i remember and she named every single one of her uh-huh. teachers because she went there for three years because yeah. and so here she is you know much older in today's world but it's still a wonderful loving a, memorable experience yeah yeah well the biggest takeaway for me in this episode and i don't have children but has your child lost their smile yeah. that is a huge yeah. that's like that would that you when you said yep. that that was like a hello i know exactly what that means and for our parents who are watching or listening that they do too i i hope yeah. that's a if that's going on in your house i mean we have resources check here that's so, right. check it out thank you everyone for listening today watching today um for those of you who have already downloaded subscribed and shared please do it again with your <laughs> friends and associates of to this podcast wherever you like to listen and please visit Marsha's website MarshaClarkAndAssociates.com for links tools resources here and check out her book you know we always today was a one-off we didn't really talk about the book at all but that's all right, that's right. you know we, it's we there in, in its own way in its own, own way book. that's Embracing right the book. <laughs> that's, that's right, right. That's, that's right, right. <laughs> book and magnets for sale on the website <laughs> yeah. Marsha well, I'll that's let you right. close well, this out I, I too want to thank you Kathy I, I mean you know when we were making the list when we were just dreaming of doing a podcast your name was on there uh and because of the great work that you do and i think for women out there who are as you said are mothers or want to be mothers or can be an aunt or a grandparent or a a godmother or whatever all of that might look like if you have young girls and 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 boys too i don't want to limit it to that but you know i i have one that's my hashtags is value women and girls and and this idea of us being able to support each other as women, knowing what you're doing for children is is a no-brainer. And so valuing, hearing, seeing these people as human beings yeah. and God put them on the earth, this earth for a reason. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So that's I right. just will say, here's to women supporting women. <laughs>